This is Twit. Dale Baskin's back, one of our favorite photographers. He's from DP Review up in Seattle. Uh, best site in the world for figuring out what camera gear to buy. Hi, Dale. Hey, Leo. Hey, Megan. How are you guys? So you, uh, we're great. And uh, you went up. Where did you see the Northern Lights? I got to find out. Well, most recently, I went up to Yellowknife in Canada's Northwest Territories. And full disclosure, because I know you've mentioned my photos a couple of times here, a lot of the photos in the article are actually from my co-author on the article, uh, a guy named Jose Francisco Salgado, who is a world-class astrophotographer. Oh, well, I take it and all back, because Jose's needs a great to get photographer. some credit for these as well. Yeah, that's those... the first one you're looking at is his. That is amazing. Um, what? So, Yellowknife, not, but you could also go anywhere north, right? Is that is that yeah. basically it? Yeah, the key is if, if you want to get photos of the Northern Lights, there's really only three ingredients. Uh, one is you need to be where you can see the Northern Lights. The second is you need to have a camera. And the third is probably a warmer shirt than you've got on right now. Yeah. Uh, as long as you've got those three things. But generally speaking, yes, if you want to see the very intense Northern Lights, you need to get up to where what we call the auroral band is located, which is 10, 20 degrees from the magnetic pole. So you know, northern Canada, Alaska, the Yukon, Norway, that type of place. But during intense solar activity, certainly they will creep down into lower Canada, into the continental U.S. How do you find out where to go and when to when the best time to be there is? You know, that's that's a great question. Uh, it would that. depend on the area a little bit, uh, but there are some fantastic resources like websites. Uh, Spaceweather.com is Love fantastic. Love Spaceweather. Yeah, we talked about that Spaceweather is fantastic. Yeah. You can actually get auroral forecasts for wherever you're located. There are also some really good iPhone apps, and I, I don't want to endorse one or the other, but there's iPhone and Android apps that will give you alerts if there is a rural activity Ooh. likely to be seen in your area. Uh, the one you've got on screen is a fabulous one. I use it all the time. And if there is a rural activity, it will show you where it is and alert you if it's nearby. Now, so there's all, it's because it's near the magnetic North Pole, but I had heard that there were also Aurora Australis. There's Southern Lights, right? But that's different? <laughs> A absolutely. It's the same basic effect. Okay. Uh, it it's still the, the solar wind interacting with the mag Earth's magnetic, uh, excuse me, the Earth's magnetic field, uh, but it's the southern lights. It's Got a little it. harder to see because so much of the southern hemisphere is ocean. It's a little bit harder to go to some of those places. And of course, you got to go somewhere that's not too populated because lights, light pollution is always the bane of astronomical photography. Yeah, and there's really two things you want to watch out for. One is light pollution from cities, man-made light pollution, and the other is the lunar cycle. You probably don't want to go when the moon is full because it will tend to drown out the lights. A little bit of moon is actually nice. It can actually illuminate the landscape and give you some very nice photos. Think of it as a fill light. Mm. It is. It, it can be very much a fill light for the landscape. Yeah. So I've been reading a lot about how, you know, the rise of Instagram and Facebook and everyone having a camera and taking photos. There's a lot of places that are like highly Instagrammed are getting overrun. Like, is that something that you have to worry about? Like the, in these places or like, is there special care you should go, you should take when you're, you're in these natural worlds that might not have had so many people before Instagram? You know, the, the beauty of the Northern Lights is it's not quite a single place. It's not like going to the Magic Castle at Disneyland or a, a famous natural landmark like a, a natural bridge in Utah. The Northern Lights span the entire hemisphere, at least between certain latitudes. So there's not one place you're going to go overpopulate or over photograph. There are certainly cities where there's a lot of tourism, like Tromsø, Norway, and that's very much an economic driver in that. some of those places. Mm. These are just but, stunning. Yeah. So they're, first of all, when you look at this, the first thing I, I think is, oh, they're so bright, that's easy. I could just take out my camera phone and get those. But the brightness varies. It does. If you're looking at the northern lights from, say, the northern continental US when a rural activity is high, they won't be as bright as what you're seeing in the photos, although you can use your camera to expose for more light than your eye can see. To see the very bright aurora and the multicolored aurora that you're seeing in some of these photos, you really have to get up into that auroral band. And in fact, they can be as bright as you're seeing in the photos. I think wow. we've got a couple photos in here where you've got some purples, some, wow. um, some reds, and you really can see those very easily with your naked eye. I've always wanted to see these. Uh, so are these time uh, pictures? I mean, are they long exposure or... Do these move? Tell me how you take these pictures. They, they absolutely move. 
Uh, the key is you need a camera that will capture the light. Generally, a, a full-frame camera with a bigger sensor is best. Yeah. Uh, but on my recent trip, I was with a friend who actually took one of these, a little Sony RX100, which I think you're familiar with. Great camera. And he got some fantastic Aurora photos with this little camera. Uh, honestly, the sensor quality is so good today yeah. that you really don't need the best camera. Uh, what you really need is a fast lens. Uh, and when we say fast, we don't mean a lens that moves particularly quickly. <laughs> we mean one with a big aperture that lets in a lot of light. Why a wide open uh, lens. And sure. I presume you're using wide angle lenses. Typically wide angle. You don't need to. Uh, photography is art. There's no right or wrong way to okay. do it, uh, just like any other art. <sighs> Here's the uh, Here you're seeing a time lapse that my co-author Jose put together from some of his work. Um, so this is not real time. They don't move that fast. They don't shimmer that fast. You know, they? it's it's a little bit hard to describe uh, unless you've seen them in person. This is sped up. This is a time lapse. But one of the challenges of photographing them is you really can't get exposure times that are short enough to see the very intricate movement. Uh -huh. There's very often rapid dancing around of the colors uh -huh. that you'll just never see in a still photo. So it's a little bit uh, uh, unreal, but at the same time, it's not. So if I'm going to travel to one of these places, maybe take one of these tours, what kind of gear would you recommend if someone's really serious and they want the, the really good lens? What, what would you recommend? Yeah, it's a great question. If you really want to get good photos, you want a camera with a large sensor, like a full-frame sensor. Um, for example, I have a Nikon D750 here. Really good, great camera for doing it, but any camera with full-frame sensor will do it. You'll also want a fast, wide lens. Uh, the lens I've got here, you can see it's got this big bulbous element in front. And this is a 14 millimeter, so very wide, f1.8 lens by a manufacturer called Sigma. So this will allow you to both collect a lot of light and also see a very large patch of the sky at the same time. This is actually one of your picks of the year, which surprised me because I always thought of Sigma as kind of a lower end budget priced lens manufacturer. It may have that reputation historically. Over the last few years, this is a company that has been incredibly focused on making high quality optics. Nice. And their approach is size, design, shape, be damned, we're going to make great optics. And, and if you get something from their art series, they are fantastic lenses. Wow, good to know. So what if you randomly find yourself and then all you have is your iPhone? Is there any point in taking the picture or should you just watch it with your naked eyes and remember it in your brain? You know, one of the things, even when you're shooting this with a, a really great camera, sometimes you just have to step back and appreciate the natural phenomena for what it is. It's, it's Mother Nature's natural yeah. special effects show in the sky. Uh, but if they are bright, uh, during our trip to Yellowknife recently, uh, we ran into a local woman who had beautiful photos on her iPhone of the Aurora that she shot from a Walmart parking lot under sodium vapor lamps. So if they are really bright, you can shoot them with your iPhone. Infinite focus? What do you focus on? Uh, you generally want to focus on infinity. Relative to your position, the, the lights are maybe 100, 120 kilometers up, somewhere in that range. So effectively, they're at infinity. So okay. what we typically do is we focus on a bright star. And that allows the heavens to be in focus. And the aurora, uh, focusing on aurora, it's kind of like focusing on smoke. So you, you don't yeah. really do it directly. You find uh, a proxy for it. Actually, if we were out of focus, you might, you might not really know. Right. Uh, <laughs> you probably wouldn't, actually, yeah, except the yeah. stars might be uh, a little so bit So get blurred. the stars in focus, and the rest will follow. More or less. Now, what's and, interesting and then, to me is uh, that this is, uh, what, what f-stop are you using? Because it looks, I mean, this, is, this looks like almost high dynamic range. The sky must be very bright relative to the ship, and I, how do you do this? Uh, really, it's very basic technique. What you want to do is get the exposure times as short as possible so that you minimize the movement of the aurora. Yeah. And you you're on your sticks. ISO you're on a tripod, up. obviously. Oh, always yeah. on a tripod, yeah, yes. Yeah. Because in terms of exposure, you're talking about multiple seconds exposure, okay. Okay. anywhere from two to 10 seconds typically, but sometimes longer. And so what you do, you put it on a tripod. The foreground, whether it's a man made object, a natural object, will stay in one place and the aurora will move around, and you tend to use higher ISOs and wide apertures to let in as much light as possible. Uh, it, it's much easier than most people assume. Boy, these look great. And composition is obviously something you want to think about. Now, for this is just the sky, but so many of these other images have interesting backgrounds and foregrounds. Look at that. Yeah, and I, I have to point out a lot of these are my co-author's images. Jose, he, he goes all over the world to do this. Uh, but one of the things that he is a big proponent of is embrace the landscape, embrace yeah. man-made features. Yeah. Don't point it right at the sky because if you point right at the sky in Norway and right at the sky in northern Canada, the sky looks the same. You're not getting right. a sense of place. You're not telling the story of where you are. Right. 
And you also don't get a sense of scale. It could be anything. So it's really nice to see those trees and then Absolutely. the sky. Boy, these are beautiful. Tell Jose he's just a wonderful. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to get him on your network sometime. Yeah. He's a fantastic guy. Well, it's my, you know, it's funny. Since I've been a kid, and it must have been a kid's book or something that I read, I've always wanted to see the Aurora Borealis. And it's one of the many sites in the world I have yet to see. So I, maybe we'll do a trip well, you, up You should there come with us sometime, yeah. Leo. We would happy to do a oh, tour up there I, if you I want. I would really love to. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, thank you, Dale, and thanks, Jose, for those amazing images. Of course, you can read more about it at dpreview.com. And, uh, and I noticed that you guys were on an expedition. Uh, there's a company in those images that does these, so you could even find out about that, I would presume. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Dale Baskin. Really thank nice to talk to you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, Dale. Boy, that makes me want to go.